Oh, that was that was really good. Um, yes, very good. Just so you know, like as some of you guys are out there going, "Wow, that was uncomfortable. That was different." Um, you know, I wish it was easy, like for Francis and Lisa, and, and that it's. We've all got baggage, you know. Like I shared last night, like I got issues that I. How do you miss? the throne of grace as a preacher for 40 years. You know, like, how do you never picture his throne that way? Um, and so even in relationship, conversation, I, uh, as I'm listening to Mick and, and what's your face? <laughs> Stephanie? Okay, sorry. Um, that's part of my issues. I don't remember uh, names, but uh, mm-hmm. Mick and Stephanie... I, I just thought, wow, what a gift. Um, that's not normal for us. You know, we don't wake up and go, oh, let's do that meditation thing. Um, in fact, like, that's just like one of my, one of my uh, weaknesses is, you know, because I just grew up in a family that didn't talk. Um, we didn't ever have a serious conversation. And I grew up with parents. I never had a single conversation with my parents. I never watched my parents talk. It was just very transactional, very business. And so there's like a a weirdness sometimes even with the family and it takes some effort to start conversation. You know, I was talking to my son last night in Africa and and just, I mean, it was great, but it's it's not the most natural thing. It's, It's work for some of us. And so... And just understand that. Uh, like, I think our marriage has been amazing. Uh, I, I don't know of a happier family. But that doesn't mean, like, oh, it's just very natural. For, I, I even remember one time, like, I was speaking at a pastor's conference, and um, they had, like, a panel of all these pastors. It was, I think it was for John Piper and one of the Bethlehem things. And, and so there were, like, five pastors up there and he, they just said hey what's tell me about your family's devotional life together and each guy was like talking about these awesome times well here's what we do every thursday night you know we did it the next guy's like well i actually have a pulpit in my upstairs <laughs> i'm like no seriously and i am sweating because <laughs> It's like four guys and me and then, you know, John Piper, who I respect so much. And each one is just talking about their regular devotional life with their family. And and everything in me is like, just make something up. (laughs) Just exaggerate that one time and make it sound like it's every week. Um, And that's where, like, I feel like Jimmy and I are such polar opposites in some of this like he's the structure think ahead everything else and I'm like just whatever fly by the seat you know they'll get it and and that's why we laugh about we go we look at our kids and in some ways we raise them exactly the same and in some ways it's polar opposites and yet here we have these kids that are just in love with Jesus and are going after it can't be more excited about their walk with the Lord. And so just understand, I, I throw that out. I mean, when it did come to my turn at that pastor's conference, I'm like, oh, okay, you guys, I don't do any of that. <laughs> you know? And I go, it's weird. And I Piper next to me goes, oh, I'm so glad you said that. You know? <laughs> and... Uh, and, and it was, I'm like, are you serious? He goes, yes. And, and we just talked about the awkwardness. And, and, and I was just, it was the coolest thing. But um, <laughs> just to throw it out there, that it's going to be different for each of us. And, uh, and we all have different baggage and, and stuff like that. And um, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, uh, everything always don't. comes down to like is your is your heart to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Um 
because maybe we should have more structure. That's very possible. But we can say, we can look at each other and say, like, our home is for Christ. Like, we, we are on a mission. You know, we are here for the kingdom of God. And it's actually, I just told Francis again during the encouragement, I'm like, you, I always say the same thing, but it's true. It's the thing I'm most thankful for is that he leads our family with an eternal mindset. He always brings us back to why are we here? We're here for Christ. We're here for the gospel. We're here to make the kingdom advance. And we're here to enjoy God and love him and know that we're going to be with him. I actually remember reading John Piper's book, Seeing and Savoring Jesus Christ. This was 20 years ago. And when he was saying like, I think he said, you know, if you, could, if you knew heaven was going to have all your favorite things, food, activities, people, you were surrounded by all of it, but Jesus wasn't there, would you be okay with that? And it struck me to the core because I was, I was it shocked me because I thought, oh my gosh, I don't think that I'm like crazy for heaven because Christ is going to be there. I'm going to be with Christ. So what is that? That's revealing in my heart. Like, wow, thank you, Lord. That started changing my prayers. And I hope you catch something from, I hear it in the heartbeat of this church. I know it's Jimmy and Laura's heart. It's our heart. We never want to set ourselves up here and say like, hey, we've got it figured out and we've never made any mistakes. And it's like, no, but Christ is so full of grace, and at any moment, he can reveal your heart to you and say, look how off you are, and in a second, he can give you the grace to say, you can overcome it. You are an overcomer. There is no temptation that has overtaken you. Not one, not one temptation has overtaken you that you have no way of escape. God is faithful. He is faithful. And he will show you a way out. So don't ever believe that lie from the enemy that, nope, you are too far gone. You've made too many mistakes. You've messed this up. I mean, there's so many times. I I remember the first time I had to say to one of my daughters, like, oh my gosh, I am sorry, Rachel. I I literally have tried to take the place of the Holy Spirit in your life. And she kind of looked at me like, mom, what are you saying? (laughs) And I was like, I am so overdoing it with like, I want to be the Holy Spirit and I'm not leaving room. I was like trying to figure it out. She was our firstborn, you know? Bless the firstborns. <laughs> Sorry. I've, I literally even, we, we now laugh about it. I hug her. She's 27 years old, married with two children. And I say, I'm sorry, honey. You know, we did our best, but it's like, you were the guinea pig. I'm sorry. <laughs> and it's not like now we're perfect and we have it figured out, but we, we have learned the rhythm. We have stepped back a little bit like, hey, God's sovereignty covers way more than we recognize. And, and he has an interest in gathering our children's hearts to him way more than, than I do. And so oh, just confession is so wonderful. We can repent at any moment and we can ask God for the things that we don't have. If you don't have it, if you don't feel it, ask the Lord. It's the ones who, who ask that shall receive. And if you don't ask, that's what the enemy wants to, he, it's like he just wants to silence you and make you think, no, God doesn't want to give that to you. But it's not true. God's heart is for you, and his grace is sufficient for you, and he will give you the power to overcome all things. So be quick to repent. One of our, it was Vince that was telling us, um, there was a group of believers Hmm. that were known as the repenters. That's what the people called that group of believers, the repenters. Why are those people always repenting? It's like, wow, how beautiful is that? Because what does that show? Humility, right? And humility is your best friend. (laughs) If you can be quick to repent, um, even like, now I'm going to forget his name, Nick and Stephanie. No. No, Mick. Mick, Mick, sorry. Sorry. You got mad at me. (laughs) 
I know. Sometimes I try to like pump myself up and tell Francis like, oh, I don't even remember that you did that wrong. And he's like, honey, this isn't about you being holy. You just, uh, you know, you keep no record. Like, you know, it says love keeps no record of wrong. He's like, you just keep no record. <laughs> so it's not like a, it's not like a blessing for you. <laughs> you, you just are a little bit crazy. No. <laughs> and it is true. Uh, but I try to remember the most important things like our children's names and birth dates, which yes. he can never remember. So. so our second daughter, I forgot her name, but she, uh, <laughs> I don't remember their names. I always say the wrong one, though, yes. at the time. But do you remember their birthdays? No. no. Ours, roughly. <laughs> no, I, I think I'd, I'd know all of ours. I always forget Claire, though. It's either May 29th or 30th. So I just know it's in that general. That's good. It's the 30th. 30th. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, were you going to say something about McNick? You said Nick and Stephanie. Oh, and did I get sidetracked? Oh. Then you started talking about, oh, I forget names. And uh, oh, he keeps no record. It's not important. I forgot. Yep. It's all right. Totally okay. forgot. Sorry, there um, it goes. No, no, no. There Pers- we go. I wanted to give proof to everyone that I really can't keep a record. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Um, where do we go from here? You know, here's, here's what one of the things that I really want to do this morning. Um, I want to pray for humility. It's a, it's a gift. It's, it's a miracle. Like I want to believe in a miracle. Um, and you know, usually we think healing of some physical sort, and, and that's great, amazing, but. Like some of you here, some of you guys watching, some of you who will watch this, there's a level of, of pride in your life that is just, it's beyond what you think it is. You're deceived. You know, like we talked about deception. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been confronted on pride. I, I remember... I remember in it's either college or seminary that a couple times where I, I, I picture one time specifically this pastor just confronting me on my pride and I was just like explaining myself. I go, well, you saw that as pride, but really um, it's a higher level of humility that you don't understand. <laughs> you know, it was just like... I was just, and I I still remember, as I'm explaining this, he's like, are you listening to yourself? He goes, you're defending your humility right now. Think about that for a while. And and I, I literally walked out of his office going, you don't know me. And there was just no way of him getting through to me. We've all had those conversations where you're going, wow, this is one of the most arrogant people I've ever met. And you try to explain that to them. Like I would just state things like, okay, I've met a lot of people in my life and you're in the top two most arrogant. I don't know if that says anything to you. <laughs> no, I don't resonate. You, you, it's just like, <laughs> there's... There's no getting through any little bit because when you're proud, you can't, you you won't admit that you're proud. That's the whole definition. And that's why I'm like, God, I I can't just tell people they're proud. No one was able to tell me I was proud. You somehow did it. You somehow, through your grace, through humiliation, through my own sin, finding me out, through whatever it took, like, God, you're, you're the only one that can expose this. And I know there's a way. I mean, the Bible says, humble yourselves. And so there is something we do 
And so the start maybe is just this prayer for you to agree with me. And say, God, I need your humility. But, but I want to humble myself because I've tasted of the times when you humble me. And honestly, I don't like it. You know, at the time, at least. You know, now I look back, oh, I'm so glad you humbled me back then in that way, as embarrassing, horrifying as it was. But I really, I would really from here on out hum, like to humble myself, um, <laughs> you know. And I am commanded to do that. And so I'm just going to pray for a spirit of humility Father, none of us see how proud we are. God, it's just so helpful last night to stare at who you are. Someone who can't be touched. A blazing fire, darkness, gloom, a tempest. Surrounded by innumerable angels. The only truly immortal one who's always been. Every demon is only in existence because you permit that demon to have life. Every breath in this room that is taken, God, as we dwell on who you are, who dwells in unapproachable light and imagine your throne of grace, we're coming before your throne of grace and just say, open our eyes to our own pride that's destroying us, destroying our families, destroying our witness on this earth. Please, Lord, make us like Jesus. Miraculously, make us like Jesus this morning. Through your spirit, through your word, by your grace, humble us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we were doing a a marriage conference in Hawaii once. I tend to say yes to those more than Waco. Um, But uh, one of the things we did, just kind of spur the moment, our kids were there, and and, uh, it was really fun, actually. We formed like a family band, you know, and uh, because all my kids are musical, and I I learned electric guitar real quick, tried to learn that... uh, Solo, uh, it was it was horrible. It was not that great. It wasn't that great <laughs> because of me. All my kids are musicians, but I wanted to be a part of the band, and uh, and I had it down when there's no crowd. And then we got there, and you have these ear monitors, and I couldn't hear the drums, and I'm like, Da-da-da. and it started that one over, and we did like three times. I'm like, forget it. Um, but during the conference, I was like, hey, uh, kids, why don't you come up here? I want you to huddle up, and I want you to share the best thing we did as parents, the worst thing we've done as parents, and the funniest thing we've done as parents. And, and I meant like one thing. <laughs> I didn't mean like each of you share one thing. And... Uh, but they, we didn't, didn't plan this. You didn't even know I was going to do that. I did not. And uh, I didn't know I was going to do it. Um, <laughs> but it was very interesting to hear the kids share, like, um, where we failed in their perspective. And, uh, yeah, it, it was just, uh, but I, I wanted to just... Let everyone know, look, here's what we've done. And 
I mean, I fell out of my chair at one point laughing hysterically because I forget some of the stupid things I've done. Um, None of the funny stories were about me. Yeah. FYI. Yeah. (laughs) They were all gentle with you. It it was always me. Um, (laughs) They find that 2%. Um, Oh, that's what I was going to bring up. Yeah. (laughs) Was it? Just how I connected with him on only having 2% of the responsibility. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, that's fine. Um, anyways, back to humility. <laughs> there, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hawaii, 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 Hawaii. Yeah. I mean, it was funny. One of the, one of the ones I forgot, you know funniest moments, I guess Ellie shared about how one time they wanted, her and Zeke, they're like a year apart, they asked, uh, you know, can we stay up late? And I said, okay, if you put peanut butter on Ellie's armpit and then lick it out, (laughs) you guys can stay up another hour. (laughs) Good parenting. You know, but they're just bringing up different illustrations like that that I would just totally forget about. There was one, though, I don't even think I should share here, but I just, like, fell over. <laughs> Jimmy wants dirt. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was right on the edge. Okay. Um, okay, so it was... Uh, Rachel was sharing, oh, one time, Dad, me and Mercy wanted to go to 7-Eleven. We were little kids, and, and, uh, <laughs> and I didn't want to walk them to 7-Eleven, you know. And uh, I'm like, okay, here's what you have to do. I go, either one of you needs to poop on the sidewalk. <laughs> like, who says something like that? It's just so dumb. Or you eat one of those roses right there. And so Rachel made her little do- sister eat one of the roses. I was like, I was kidding, you guys. Like, and I, you know, then I got mad at Rachel. She was talking about that. Then you got mad at me for making her eat the rose. And then you took her to 7-Eleven, but not me. And I'm like, well, it's just... I, there's no point in any of this. Okay, anyways, let's get into the scriptures. Let's talk about humility. Um, I, I want to share a passage with you. I alluded to it last night a little bit, but I want us to stare at it because it's so good. And, and uh, it's, it's um, Matthew 11, uh, verse 28. So, um, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, this is another phrase that's... There's this book out called Gentle and Lowly uh, by Dane Ortland. I I don't know who he is, I'm not saying, you know... I'm just saying it's a great book. Don't cancel me if he's like a fanatic or some weirdo. Anyways, the book itself is good. You know, I just always get canceled for whoever I'm friends with. Um, I'm not even a friend of him, okay? Dane, if you're there, we're not friends. I don't know who he is. I, I feel like we ought to do this every, every time we say anything good about anyone. But uh, um, it's a good book. Um, at least the first half. I only read the first half so far. So the second half has all his heresy. I'm halfway through it. Um, First half is good. But it's called Gentle and Lowly. Um, Okay, so don't cancel me again. Uh, Gentle and Lowly in Heart. Uh, But his point was, he says, you know, this is the only time in Scripture where Jesus describes his own heart. So we need to pay attention to that. This is the heart of God. And, and, don't go, or the, and don't do what I've done for many years where I, I kind of 
look at Jesus on the earth as so different from God Almighty in heaven. Or, well, that was like a kind of a respite. That was just like a, a little parenthesis in who he was when he was on the earth. I mean, there's some truth to that, that he emptied himself of his glory. But, but when he was on the earth, it was every bit what God was. He was the image of the invisible God. He wanted us to know what he is like in all of his glory. And, and so the only time he describes his heart and, and the heart and the Hebrew mindset, it's, it's like the core of your being. It's the mission control center. It's not one little part of you, like a finger or an eye. No, your heart is, is who you are. This is your name. And he's saying, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Like, God Almighty is saying, would you learn from me? As powerful as I am, I'm gentle and lowly at the core of my being. I'm humble. And you certainly see that in the life of Jesus, right? It's like, wow, this is who he is. That's probably one of the first words you think of when you think of Christ on the earth. What was he like? It's like, you're telling me he was on his throne, the lightning, the thunder, the fire, the angels, the, you know, the darkness, the gloom, the tempest, and he's washing feet, and he's letting people spit on him and beat him, and now he's saying, learn from me. This is who I am. I'm the most approachable being on the planet. Mm. And those two things don't go together in our minds. But that's why God, he goes, I'm so far beyond you. In your world, those who are most famous are most unapproachable. In your world, those who are most powerful are the ones you can't get to. And he says, I'm gentle and lowly. And I'm telling you to draw near to my throne of grace. And I'm telling you, you can be one with me. And and so this is our role model in life. Mm -hmm. That's why the pride that, that, that creeps up that's in all of us that we don't see, it's, it's so ugly because this is my role model. I want to be gentle. I want to be lowly in spirit. This is big in the sight of God. Mm-hmm. And it's very hard to fight with a humble person. When's the last time you got in a fight, you know, and it just escalated with a humble person. It's, it's the pride. It's, you know, we, we write in our book uh, about how no spirit-filled couple has ever divorced in the history of mankind. It's one or the other has to lose that spirit-filled or both. You're, you're not walking in the spirit this gentle and lowly God in his spirit. You're not, and then add each other to where you go, we're done. We're done. It's never happened. You got to walk away from him. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing, you know. Um, why we talked about last night, you know, what I talked about last night, um, is the, the feelings and everything else, um, you know, as good as our relationship is, like I, I look at my, my wife and as great as she is, there's just times when you're not feeling it. Um, and, and so it's not always like, 
oh, because she's so great, I'm going to love her in return, everything else. At the end of the day, um, I mean, let me, let me back this up. Okay, like, I pray, I go, God, selfishly, could you keep Lisa alive as long as I'm on the earth? Like, I just don't want to go through life without her. Um, yeah, I, I'd rather just die first, you know, if I can, you know, or together or we'll crash somewhere. Um, <laughs> like, I just don't want to go through that uh, because this is my partner and I, I want this for life. Um, but there's days, you know. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, but at those times, like, I can, I, I say that, but I also know I can live without her. I could. But I can't live without peace with God. And, and the Bible says that, he tells the, the husbands, um, you know, to live with your wives in, a, in this respectful way and to see her as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So some way where if I don't treat her the right way, God's not listening to my prayers. That I can't handle. I really can't live without. I, I can't move on. That's why that, that at the core of who I am, it's like, gosh, I understand this, who this God is, and I'm going to stand before him, but everything's in his control. And, and so what do I, I spend a day separated from him? And, and so because I can't live that way, I'm just not happy. I can't preach. I can't, I, I don't do anything right when this isn't right with him. And and so, because this is part of this equation, so even if I don't feel like she deserves it or whatever else, or I feel like it's her fault, or, you know, it's that woman you gave me, the, the whole thing, you know, I can't, I can't even go there because I have this fear of God and I have this need of God where I go, I, I can't go a day without you. And so, all right, I got to go fix this. And, because, and the feeling's not there. It's like, oh, I want to be a good husband and fix it. It's like, at the end of the day, I can't live without a close relationship with God. I can't live with just the, the brevity of life. I'm just like, God, I just always want to be right with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's at the core of all of this. Mm-hmm. And so I think someone said it earlier, um, Stephanie. Uh-huh. And... Uh, <laughs> About, you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't remember what I was going to say. She said something good. And, uh, but it was something about God. <laughs> I, I forgot. The... I totally understand you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I was just thinking about, like, when I think about our almost 30 years of marriage, like the, the biggest switch for me, if I think about where where did the the sanctification come like um, it was when I stopped trying to find my, or get my motivation from him or being so overly frustrated to like you know if it 's any encouragement to you guys i I just needed to make a loud noise when I was so mad at him. So I threw my shoe at the closet once, just left this big old black scuff mark just to remind me of my, my anger and immaturity. Um, but like that's how I just would feel, I would get so angry or I'd slam a cupboard door. You know, it's like there, there was just such like... Whenever I write a marriage card, I'm like, welcome to one of the most humbling, sanctifying, amazing journeys of your life. Because it it, you know, like now, 30 years later, I can laugh about that. But it's like, it was real then, where I'm just so mad and so angry and so filled with my own, like, look what, look how he's treating me. And I don't deserve this. And I'm so frustrated with him. 
And it wasn't until it was like, it's funny because one of my friend's moms handed me a book and it was called The Excellent Wife. And it is not even in print anymore. I'm sorry. So you can't cancel me because you can't even get it and order it and read it. So, um, <laughs> but it like slowly the Lord happened to use that little book to just like transform my heart. And it was filled with scripture. So it wasn't even necessarily about the lady. It was just all these passages about like how God wants us to live, like this heart of humility, this like, oh, I, more than anything, I have to be right with God. Mm. Like Francis is saying, like if that motivation, if that can switch in you to the point where I, it was like a, a few years ago, maybe like five, but we're, we're having one of those fights that you like take to bed, which you're not supposed to do because the Bible says you're not let the sun go down on your anger. But we were, the sun was down and, <laughs> <laughs> and the anger was really high. And uh, he's, it, <laughs> I was so frustrated. So now here's 20 years in, but with a lot of time with the Lord and scripture and meditation and some sanctification, praise God. But still, like, he said something that was, like, so hurtful that I, I've never thought about, like, bolting and running out the door. But I literally felt that angry. I wanted to run out the door. I pictured myself running down the street. And it's like, in my mind, I'm playing this out. Like, what, what am I going to do? I'm just going to go run down the street and what? Like, scream or, I don't know. I was just so, so hurt. And... <laughs> Just so I was just going to share that. That's the one time I heard you swear. Oh, no, on. I did not. <laughs> no, I did not. Do you ever know what this makes me feel? I just want to say. Oh, I did? <laughs> wow. I don't even remember that. I keep no record. Okay, I do not remember that. I cussed? I mean, yeah. Wow. And then you threw your tiara? Oh, my I gosh. Her Miss Teen, she still wears it with her sash. But <laughs> now that that part's an exaggeration, okay, but okay, the swearing okay. is true. Oh my gosh, I, I do not remember that. I know. Wow. I know. Okay, anyways, but anyways, okay. well, awesome. now you know how sinful I am. But um, <laughs> but by God's grace, this is how I know that there's there's like God's grace is sufficient because. Everything in me is picturing running out the door and running down the street. But what I do is start to pray out loud. And not once have I ever, like, don't think like, oh, wow, Lisa Chan just prays every time they get in an argument. How holy. Like, it was just a one-time thing. But I cried out to the Lord. And we're, like, laying there in bed. I mean, do you remember this? And I, I just start praying, like, God, you have to help us right now. We need your grace. Like, I don't know what to do. And, and so I just start praying. And I can't even tell you, I can't even tell you how it all ended and whatever. But in that moment, well, we're here, so I can tell you how it ended. But, <laughs> um, but like, praise God for the grace to just cry out to him in that moment. Like, I, I knew enough. Like, yes, it's true. That's why we want you here sitting and learning from all these amazing people. And like, what they did taking you through those scriptures, and I was like, wow, if, if marriage conferences would actually just do a lot of that, we'd be in a much better place. If we get people meditating and praying through the word of God, like, that is life-changing, you know, reading the books is fine, but the word of God and like just having that wash over you to where, yeah, I would, I would be able to cry out to the Lord in the middle of such an intense argument. That's only the grace of God. Yeah, and I don't want to, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where we want to tell you like here's some of the mess in our lives. Um, at this, you know, but I just want to be completely truthful. And really, we rarely fight. Yes, that's true. I mean, this is like a once in 20 year blow up. Um, and it's short lived because I can't, I can't live. I just can't live with a lack of peace here. And I, I do remember one time just, you know, that passage, I think it's First Peter, you know, it's talking about the husbands, like just, 
you don't want your prayers hindered so that your prayers aren't. And I remember one time she took the humble route and, you know, because my way of getting under her skin is I don't, I don't yell. I just say sarcastic things. Um, I'm just great at sarcasm and just like little things. And I know just, exa- I mean, I'm a, te- I'm a preacher, you know, we know how to communicate. And so I knew how to get her angry, but make it look like I'm not trying to, you know, it's, it's a, a real skill. And, uh, <laughs> but I remember one time I knew she wanted to say something back and she didn't. And she just humbled herself. And, oh, that made me so mad. Because I just remember laying in bed, and again, I'm trying to pray, but I'm thinking about God's perspective. Of He's just looking at me like, why are you talking? You know, but I'll listen to that little angel next to you. You know, like, it, it just was like, wow, she's, she's okay with the Lord right now, and I'm not. And I'm... I'm not this gentle and lowly, I'm nothing like Jesus right now. That's not okay to me. Um, and that's, that's at the root of so much of this. But There's actually a lot of, I mean, you guys have probably heard them, but just coming in my mind right now, like better to be on the corner of a, of a house or a roof than, than with a quarrelsome wife, like, or that constant dripping is like a quarrelsome wife. Um, and then I'm thinking about First Peter 3, like when you say gentle, I can't help it. Um, but First Peter 3, because it's, it is so interesting to me. I went to kind of proof text. I wanted to look up the word gentle. This was like months ago. And I actually wanted to kind of communicate to a very specific woman, like your need to be gentle. But then I went... What, what popped up was, was Matthew also, and I, it's almost like Francis with the throne of grace. Like, all of a sudden, in my mind, I've, I know First Peter 3. I've quoted that a hundred times. Like, I've taught that over and over again, which is, I'll read it so you guys actually know what it is. Um, oh, yes. Wow, it's really blurry. Can you read it? Likewise, in chapter 3, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. How awesome is that? That your husband could be won over just by the way you act. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And now I'm thinking, well, of course it's very precious. It's because... He's gentle and lowly in heart. And, and as I was going to like speak to this woman with this passage, and then all of a sudden God is like ushering in these thoughts of like, I am gentle. It's not just for women. Like, like I am gentle. I am God of heaven, and I am, I am gentle. And I... I do feel like there is a a strength, and I have no problem feeling like this is a specific call for women. Like, there is something very beautiful and precious about women who will conduct themselves with a gentle and quiet spirit. And I don't pretend to know how that works out, that men, you are also supposed to be like Christ and be gentle, but there is a strength in your gentleness that we're not supposed to have. You guys do carry a position of authority and leadership in a way that we don't. That's why the Lord says, you know, treat your wives in an understanding way. They're a weaker vessel. Some people are so offended by that. But I'm like, yes, the Lord gets us. We are, we are not the ones who usually go to war. Like they, men need a little more fight, a little bit more oomph. And they do need to be gentle in their 
in their interactions with people like Christ, but there's something very different and separate about how God created men and how God created women. And we need to celebrate that and embrace it and be like, wow, God, teach me, show me, how do I press into this side of who God is? Like, he's specifically saying this for women because our adorning, one of my daughters was just showing me this is why I don't have social media or anything, but she's just like, oh, mom, everybody in my department is getting lips done, eyes done, and these are young girls. I mean, she's 24 years old, my daughter, and she's telling me how all these girls are having their implants and also their buttocks implants. I'm like, seriously? Um, so, you know, the fake eyelashes... That used to be such a like rare thing, right? And Lord bless you if you're wearing them today. I can't figure out how to glue those things on. They never stay. But we just don't, it's like we're so about external adornment and just trying to make this thing that's not going to last look so good. And God is like, when's the last time you adorned the inside? Like adorn the hidden person of the heart. It's hidden, you guys. Nobody sees that but it comes out of you. And it's a beauty that is imperishable. It will never fade. And it's precious to the Lord. It's precious to him. So spend more time thinking about the hidden person of the heart than standing in front of that mirror and thinking, how can I just look as hot as I possibly can and stay as young looking as I possibly can? No. I just, I want to... I want God to find me precious, (laughs) and I want to believe what is precious is what he says, not what the world says. Mm. Mm. Yes, I mean, when's the last time that thought even entered your mind of, I want God to look at me and see me as beautiful? I mean, that's powerful. And God's sight is very precious, the gentle and quiet spirit. Look, we live in a world where this is not lifted up. Just reading this verse is very offensive, maybe to some of you that are watching right now. And, but that's, um, that's a lot of God's word. It's just, it goes so contrary to the world. And that's the whole idea. The whole world is going a certain direction. Ephesians 2 says that. You're just following the course of this world. You know, but then God makes us alive and shows us the truth. And at some point we can change and go, gosh, I've never even thought about how I look in the sight of God. Do I have this quiet and gentle spirit? Um, And that's where in verse 7 it says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So there's a way of showing honor. I mean, again, just reading this verse will make people so angry of how dare you call me the weaker vessel. Um, But the idea is, one of this perfect, um, the idea is, if I drop these two things, which one do you worry about? You know, this one. This is, this is a perfect picture. This is us, guys. It's like, you know. <laughs> and so we think, man, how come I can't do that with you? Why don't, why don't you just bounce back? And it's like, well, you're different, you know? That's not a bad thing. Like, what would you rather be? You, you know, it's, it's like, what is of more value? It's, it's not. And so the idea is not, why can't you be like me? But it's like, no, you're different, and you deserve a special honor, and I'm actually here to protect you in some ways. And, and it's, this is so different. you got to understand, like, and we're living in a different culture this is so unique, um, where suddenly, I mean, in my lifetime, I've seen the switch. Like, wait a second. It's been one way 
for 6,000 years, and then our generation is going to change it. And, and we just believe we were the ones that evolved to this point, and, and we can look at these passages that have stood for 6,000 years and be embarrassed of them now. And I praise God for this church because you stand on the word of God without apology, and that's huge because the Bible says that the church is supposed to be the pillar that holds up that, that, the truth. And, um, and that's why I love being here, uh, is just going, you know what, oh, it's nice to be in agreement that this is where the word of God is, um, and it's the same, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, some of these verses have been abused and taken, absolutely, we're not denying that, but to, to just throw some of these things away because people have abused them, it's just wrong. Because when Christ returns, and it sure feels like it's coming soon, he's coming soon, um, he says, if you're ashamed of me and my words, I will be ashamed of you on that day. And so it's not even enough to just kind of vaguely go, yeah, I, 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 I believe in the word. But just to read it out loud and go, I'm not going to apologize for this. It, it says what it says. And so I'm going to pursue that. And like I said last night, man, that's why we have the word of God, because I naturally wouldn't have thought of God that way. I naturally wouldn't have thought of myself as a man this way. I would naturally think of Lisa. You know, my natural thinking would be, why can't you do this? I can do this. Why don't you toughen up? Why did that hurt you? It wouldn't have hurt me. That's my natural thinking. And a lot of that is, is the world telling me to think that way when Scripture says, no, honor, honor, be like Jesus. And Jesus was gentle and lowly. And this has to be the goal of our lives, where you go, Jesus, okay, maybe my goals have been off. And I've been thinking about this perfect family. I'm thinking about, you know, security. I'm thinking about, you know, a nice home, the kids playing in the yard. I'm not thinking my goal in life is to look like Jesus, to become like God, who shows grace and who is gentle and lowly. And, uh, and there needs to be a switching, a humbling, and going, wow, I, I had the wrong goal. Um, I wasn't thinking about becoming like Christ. So I just want to read um, a passage where I'll, I'll admit I've been embarrassed of it in the past. Um, try, it's not like I try to, it's just I, I feel it. I feel the tension when I read it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I want to quickly apologize for it right after, you know. Um, but Ephesians 5 starting in verse 22. And I usually don't even, a lot of times, don't start in 22. I'll go to 25, because it's more acceptable. Um, we'll just read it in the order that it's in. Uh, God's word, remember the God we talked about last night? Tempest, gloom, throne. He says, Ephesians 5, 22, wives, submit to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. 
In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of God, and I am not embarrassed of it. And this is what he says. This is how our marriages should look. Um, This is how he designed us. He is the creator. And we're going to hear the exact opposite, as we always do, from the world. And there was a lot of deception in this room. And it's not just wives that uh, hate the S word here, submit. Not the S word you use. Um, (laughs) Wives. (laughs) The... Uh, it's uh, what was my point? I lost it. Um, I just got so excited about that joke suddenly. Um, it's yeah, it's the word of God. I forgot what I was say. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Um, man, I just want to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Um, it's just, this is just the way God created us. And oh, this is what I was going to say. Um, husbands, some of us don't feel like leading. It's not, it's not fun um, a lot of times. And a lot of times I don't, I don't want to break the heart of my family and go, oh, I I believe God's calling us to do this. And you know, this is, they're not there yet. And many times I just want to back off. It's like, God, I just, I just want to let it flow. And, but sometimes I'm called to lead and go, hey, guys, I, I know this isn't easy. I really think God wants us to go in this direction as a family, or he wants us to move here, or he wants us to do this, and uh, just sit on it for a bit. Um, I'm sorry, you know, because, uh, you know, sometimes we hear these things from God, and it's so much easier just to ignore it, and, um, but we're called to lead, and sometimes confront some things that are wrong, um, and and it's much easier just to go with what the world's thinking is as well. It's just a complete partnership. And, you know, unless you're both in 100% agreement. And it's like, no, there's times when I'm, I've got to lead. And I don't want to. But I'm commanded to. And I am to be the head of the home. And God created me to do this. And I will be this. And I will do this. Um, but I don't feel like it. A lot of times. I'm tired. And we talk about that now. We're tired. We've been raising kids for 27 years. And we still have an eight-year-old at home. (laughs) And so does it seem fun? You know, it was super fun to play baseball when I was 40. You know, (laughs) and uh, but it's like, nope. I'm leading this thing. I'm, you know, I'm going to get out and be active. I'm going to be friends with them. I'm going to, you know, and if God calls us to something, then once again, we're going to do it again. Because I don't want to be one of those old guys that did all these radical things when I was 18 for the Lord. And each year I played it safer and safer. And uh, because I'm just tired, I mean, the young people are dying for older couples who are still living by faith. And I get it. It's harder. And it's easier. You know, we're praying about that today. We don't want to be people that's like, well, we did our thing. It's like, gosh, we're getting closer and closer to seeing the very throne. And 
I want to end strong, and I want to I be more intimate with you, Lord, than ever. I want us to be closer and, and see you more closely as a family. I don't want to I don't want to sit back on, wow, we've had some great times, haven't we? And okay, now it's my, the time for our kids to raise our kids for us. You know, because sometimes I honestly feel that. I'm like, well, let the older guys teach my eight-year-old. You take them out. You, 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 you know, I've done this for long enough. And it's like, no, no, I'm going after it. He's going to be our godliest. You know, I'm going to just, you know, it's, it's just, it, it's just, you know, let's, let's go with this thing. I'm just saying, and God's word, I'm not going to back off on it because the world is more against it now. No, that's why I just recently started preaching again. Um, just because I'm just like, you know what? This is the time when people need preachers is when you will get canceled and you will be hated. I think that was kind of weird to me when it, it was almost like a popularity thing, but now there's no chance of that. You preach the word of God, you will be canceled. And so everyone's a little timid, you know, to, and, and so it's like, well, then I'm going to, I'm just going to say it and that's okay. I just don't want to be ashamed at the end. I don't want Jesus to return and go, I'm ashamed of you because you were ashamed of my words. He's taught one thing about marriage and morality from the time of Adam and Eve. And that's why he's, he quotes, you know, he's Genesis here. Mm. It's like, it hasn't changed. You know, 4,000 years later, it hasn't changed. And now 2,000 years later, it's not like something weird happened once we hit the year 2000 and, and we could change all of this and we have the right and we figured it out that the most depressed suicidal generation in all of history figured it out. Um, it's... <laughs> No, it's the word of God. And, and uh, so, man, we want to humble ourselves before the word of God and say, Lord, I, I, I know I've been influenced by the world. I know I've fought and believed in some of these lies. And I've been embarrassed of your word. And just admit it before the Lord. Mm-hmm. I mean, I admit before God, I didn't, I, I, I didn't like reading Ephesians five twenty two to twenty four, because um, I just thought that's embarrassing. People are going to think I'm one of those guys, and da, da 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 da, you know. And even at weddings, when you know they'd ask for this passage, I there was just I'd kind of skim. I'd re- I really would read twenty two to twenty four as fast as I could, and they go, "Husbands, love your." wives, you know, and I would challenge the guy, you know, because I would just feel the tension in the crowd. And now I'm just saying, you know what? You know what's precious in that sight of that holy God? A gentle and quiet spirit in a woman. If it matters to you that that's beautiful in his sight, go after that. Mm -hmm. And I will tell husbands like, you are called to lead your families, period. And it's, it's our responsibility. You know, and Adam was wrong when he says, oh, it was that woman you gave me, and she deceived me. It's her fault. No, I, I just kind of, I just understood from day one, God, by his grace, that it's always my fault. You know, I don't, I don't mean that in a joking way or whatever, but I really look at it that way. Well, it's, it was your lack of leadership that caused this. As your lack of humility, your lack of prayer, I just kind of look at it that way. It's like, well, if I'm bothered by something, I didn't lead well. If I'm bothered in something in my kids, I didn't lead well. I wasn't exemplary. I didn't get on my knees. You know, there's certain things for sure that... Uh, or not my response. I can't make my kids love Jesus. Okay, that is, that is up to you, Lord. Um, but there's, there are things that I need to do. And real quickly, I, I, I saw this illustration years ago in this book called uh, Instruments in a Redeemer's Hands um, by Paul Tripp. And he talks about um, these circles of responsibility. And he says, there's a circle for you, there's a circle for God. And sometimes people make 
their circle so big, like I'm responsible for all of this stuff. And, and that, you know, certain things belong in God's circle. Like that's his, you can't make them love God. And so you got this big old thing here and God's got this little circle. But he goes, a lot of other people do the opposite. And they're like, well, everything's in God's hands. I can't really control that. No, the Bible tells us there's, a, there's responsibility on your part. And I, and I always try to keep that in mind because there was a time where when our one daughter was just in a whole nother world than us and just everything out of her mouth was a lie. And, and Lisa's like, do you think we failed? And at that time, I'm like, no, I'm not going to take that. Of course, there's failures here and there, but that's in God's circle. I can't make her love. Everything I read in this book, it's about the Holy Spirit of God entering into her, and that changes everything. And we've been the real thing, and she's seen that. But I can't make the Holy Spirit enter into her. But once he does, everything will change. That's his responsibility. And I remember when the Spirit did enter into her. And it was like, oh. See, this is exactly what I thought would happen. And now there's almost a sense of letting go because that's what the Bible teaches. I can't make that happen, but I get on my knees and say, God, please, you're using me to lead these other people, Lord, and I can't even make my own daughter fall in love with you. There's nothing I can do but just beg for your mercy and your grace. But our job is just... You know, let's hold fast to this word and let's, let's become like Christ. And he, that may not be attractive to the world, um, to be a servant. There's not a lot of movies about servanthood um, and humility. It's just not where the world's going, but we're followers of Christ and he's beautiful to us. We have a beautiful, gentle, and lowly God of power. And so I'm honored to, to go, okay, make me like that, Lord. Mm-hmm. You want to just pray that over them? Thank you for your word. Thank you that you are so pure and beautiful. Thank you that you are the ancient of days. We want to hold unswervingly to the faith that we profess. You say that you are the God of endurance and the God of encouragement. And I pray for a spirit of endurance and encouragement over us, Lord. We would endure to the end. We would hold fast to the word. We would cling to you with everything that we have, Lord. We would believe in the power of of your example. You literally set us an example for us to imitate and follow Jesus. We are in awe of your humility. And we pray for the grace to be more like you, Lord. Teach us to cry out in the midst of our wrestling, anger, pain, bitterness, whatever it is. Help us, Lord, to open our mouth and cry out to you and believe that you hear from heaven and that you will pour out your grace on us because you desire for us to look like you and to honor you. 
So bless each one here, Lord. Thank you for their stories, their backgrounds, every part of their life that you know and understand. And thank you that you call us to something so high. And you can you you literally tell us we can rise above anything. And I just thank you for that, Lord. We believe it. And in every any way that we don't, help us to confess it and just trust that you will give us more faith to believe and to know what you can do. We love you, Lord. Be with us this day. Let us carry these truths in our heart and meditate on them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one last thing before I sit down. Um, you guys come on up. I saw you guys. It's just a... Uh, as Lisa was praying, verse came to me, um, and um, it's from a, a sermon, not a sermon, a wedding I did, and as 1 Corinthians 6, or yeah, 6 verse 7, um, I don't know what version of the Bible I had at that time, but basically... The question, I said, you know, I just want you to remember these five words from Scripture. And it's from 1 Corinthians 6 when they're suing each other and everything else. Paul asked the question, why not rather be wronged? Mm-hmm. So that's the only phrase I just want to share at this wedding. I just believe that word was for them. Why not rather be wronged? He's saying, as believers, why would you sue and try to win these arguments? That's a great question. Why not rather be wronged? It's a very revealing question. Why do I have to be right? Why do I have to win? Why do I have to prove that I'm right, you're wrong? If I believe in eternity... And I believe that Jesus' example is one who took punishment he didn't deserve and be mistreated and spit upon, emptied himself, made himself nothing, and the goal of my life is to become like him. Why wouldn't I rather be wronged? Why wouldn't I rather be the one? It's a great question. It's such a heart-revealing question. And I just want to leave you with that question from scripture what is wrong with me that I always want to prove that I'm right and uh, as believers Jesus is our example and so he says well why wouldn't you want to lose on this one if you believe in eternity if you believe in eternal reward if you believe God's watching and you want to be beautiful in his eyes why not rather suffer wrong.